Hello, everyone, and welcome to November's Author Take the Wheel here at Bookish Road Trip. I am Hope Gibbs, and as you can tell, I'm not at home. I am actually in a hotel room in Louisville, Kentucky, because I'm going to the Louisville Book Festival this weekend. Uh, but I am so excited today about our author who has taken over our Facebook page this week with some of the most engaging posts I have ever seen. And she didn't just do one book giveaway. She did two yesterday and threw me for a loop. I was so excited. And but I, I have to say this is a, a big honor because I am a huge fan of best selling author Jean Meltzer, author of The Matzo Ball. Hi, Jean. Hi, guys. Hi, everybody. Hope, thank you for having me here, guys. Everybody who's been so engaged this week, I've loved learning about you all. So thank you so much for being here. I'm just, I'm beyond thrilled. <laughs> well, this this has been, I, we talked a few minutes before we, we went live and I took <laughs> over Author Take the Wheel. My responsibility started uh, back in November. I came on Bookish Road Trip and I just discovered your book. It was the first holiday book I had ever read. And I wrote down that you were my, my dream get, my dream guest. And a year later, we're here. I'm so honored I was like your first holiday book. That is so cool. Like that I would have never thought I would hear because, you know, normally it's Christmas books. So, um, you know, Hanukkah romances and rom-coms are kind of new. So I so appreciate that. And uh, did we convert, convert you over to holiday romances? You did. So I read three more. And Whoa. so I'm not a big Hallmark Christmas movie person, but now I'm hooked and <laughs> you, you, you converted me. So you're finding your joy. <laughs> I am finding my joy. So before we begin, I want to give everyone just a little bit about your background. Um, Jean studied dramatic writing at NYU Tisch and has earned numerous awards for her work in television, including a daytime Emmy. She spent five years in rabbinical school uh, before her chronic illness forced her to withdraw. And her father told her she should write a book, just not a Jewish one because no one reads those. She is the best-selling author of The Matzah Ball, which is currently being developed into a featured film, Mr. Perfect on Paper. And Kissing Kosher is her third novel that was just released. And big kudos to you because you got a star review in Kirkus from that book. Dream come true. I never thought in a thousand years any of my books would get a star from Kirkus. So thrilled. It's a book people are loving. So if you love the Mott's Ball, it's also sort of a holiday chronic illness uh, uh, love story. Um, so definitely pick up Kissing Kosher next. Well, before we begin, I just want to remind everyone, um, leave comments, ask questions. Uh, just tell us who you are, because sometimes I can't always see on it just says Facebook user, but we also have one. We have someone who just said, so excited to be here and meet Jean. We are so excited. So so let, leave us comments and um, here we go. So let's talk about the book, The Matzah Ball. Uh, could you give us a brief synopsis for those who may not have been lucky enough like me to have read it? Absolutely. So uh, Rachel Rubenstein Goldblatt is a nice Jewish girl with a chronic illness who happens to have a secret. She loves Christmas and she has kept her, she's also um, the, she loves Christmas so much that she's actually the, uh, a world famous Christmas romance novelist, as well as having uh, four made for TV movies. She, um, but basically because she's a nice Jewish girl and her father is a rabbi, she's kept her really stellar career secret. And when her diversity conscious publisher shows up and is like, hey, we don't want Christmas books anymore. We want to do something new and different. Why don't you write a Hanukkah romance? She's completely out of ideas. She does not know what to do. So she hears about this event called the Matzah Ball, which is this huge music festival on the last night of Hanukkah. There's only one problem. Tickets are completely sold out. And the only way to get one is direct from the ball's creator, Jacob Greenberg smoking hot kosher stud muffin who just also happens to be her Jewish summer camp arch enemy. And so it's lots of antics, fun, um, secrets. Um, if you, when I sat down to write the Mops Ball, I really wanted to try to write, to see if I could write a Hallmark style book, uh, but, but make it feel authentic to the Jewish experience. So if you love Hallmark movies, if you love joy, if you love 
uh, all the magic that goes into sort of the season, it is it is it is magical. The matzo balls. So pick it up. Okay. Well, I loved Rachel. I I fell in love with her in the very first chapter because that's when you realize that she is this closeted Christmas novelist is so successful that her mother kind of always insinuates how do you have such a nice apartment because she left, <laughs> makes them think she's a free writer um, right. one person does know her secret and that is her best friend can you tell me a little bit how you created him because he was such an advocate for rachel yeah so mickey is completely based on my real life uh, best friend uh rabbi aaron weininger he was actually the first lgbt uh, rabbi to be ordained by the Jewish conservative movement, um, first to be entered into school. So um, I probably also because I was chronically ill in my first year, and because I came out of the arts, we just bonded, we became besties. And to this day, over a decade later, he's still one of the first people I call whenever I need advice, whenever I need good news. I mean, literally, the love I have for Aaron um, I poured that into the character of Mickey. So in those in those scenes, I I was literally just thinking how much I love him and our conversations and how we joke around, and and I think that's why people fell in love with him too. He's also one of the wisest people I've ever met. So he's he's a, I believe head rabbi now because we're so old uh, in Minneapolis. Well, we've already got some Facebook users saying, I love the premise. Uh, Lee says, so much fun. And she's saying, hello, Lee. So good to see you. Okay. So let's talk about Rachel. She is a complicated, smart, stubborn, and, and she's, she's, she's got so many layers. And she also suffers from chronic fatigue syndrome. Yes. How did Rachel come to life? What, what was the spark that, that brought her to the page? It's so interesting because about two years before I sat down to write the matzo ball, I actually said to someone, I don't know how you would write a book with a homebound character. And a homebound character is someone who is like me. They can't really uh, work outside the home. They can't really exist on a schedule. I've been sick since I was, I have been sick with MECFS since I was 18, 19 years old. And as I got older, my disease worsened. Um, at the worst of my disease, I was basically bed bound. I, my highlight of my life was maybe a half hour trip to the grocery store once every month or two, and that went on for like two years. And then I got a little better, but I'm still like homebound. The last 10 years, I've mainly, like I said, I, I have to move things around in my schedule. I have to adjust my energy envelope. So I have had this conversation with someone. There's no way to write a homebound disabled character because, <laughs> because the whole point of fiction is your characters have to be doing something. They have to be moving. They have to be in action. And I decided I was going to write a Hanukkah romance, a Hanukkah rom-com, on the whole other conversation. Um, and as I started writing the book, I'm seeing this young writer woman in an apartment that looked surprisingly like my apartment in the Upper West Side when I was in uh, rabbinical school. Um, it, much nicer and bigger than the one I had, but a version of it, right? And I'm seeing this character in uh, wrinkled pajamas, curly brown hair, all a mess, frizzy, um, and her friend coming over to pick up, who has picked up, Mickey picking up this sort of little Santa figurine. And as I'm writing it, I am a, I realize I am writing a chronically ill character. I am writing someone who is homebound. And it actually, what's so amazing about the book, or sometimes our subconscious ca catches up with our, our conscious, is that the whole sort of trajectory or one of the themes of the book, aside from um, fighting for your happy ending and holding on to your joy, which is always one of my big themes in all my books, is authenticity. Mm -hmm. And so Rachel has two simultaneous journeys in authenticity. One is to uh, understand herself and have her identity as a Jewish woman, and also to be to fully accept herself as chronically disabled. And so it actually worked out beautiful, the idea of secrets. You know, what's a Hallmark film without some secrets? Um, and, uh, you know, that, again, I hadn't sat down, but I realized in the process that I was writing a chronically ill character. So Lisa says, write what you know, even subconsciously, love it. And I, I love it too. And 
uh, what I loved is that Rachel, because she's now has to, to write this Hanukkah inspired book, which she does not want to do, even though her father is, you know, this famous rabbi, she doesn't find it romantic. But then she she finds out about this actual ball called the matzah ball. Mm -hmm. And of course, none other than her summer camp arch nemesis is her only way in. Can I loved how they how you went back and forth and talked about their summer camp experience. And I, I read somewhere that it was very important for you because they were 12, year, 12 years old and you thought that that was the perfect age because they, they prank each other all through the summer, uh, you know, the summer camp. Yes. So there, there were two reasons I made them 12. I'll say three. The first is, uh, you know, it's very typical in uh, holiday rom-coms, holiday romances, that there's sort of a layer of innocence. Um, and so when you're 12, it's a different type of relationship than when you're 15 and 16, right? There's more angst, we're talking, we're moving. I didn't want to put all, there was plenty with the, the dis disability. This was a time in their life where they were really innocent. Um, it's also a time in their life where something changed and they both became sort of stunted, right? So they kind of begin the book as sort of immature characters. The other main reason they are 12 is because when I was writing this book, what I was doing was still relatively, it, it is still relatively new, which is a very sort of Jewish feeling romance. That was, now we have a good handful, but like in 2021, traditionally published, didn't really do too many. Um, and especially not as much as the matzo ball. And also we had no idea what my audience would look like, but I have spent a lot of time in the Jewish world. And in the Jewish world, we have a segment of our population, which we call Shomer Nagia, which means you do not touch, you do not kiss, you do not hold hands. You certainly don't do any of the things Jacob and, and Rachel were doing uh, before marriage, not even touching. <laughs> Boys and girls, no touch. So knowing that I might have broad swath of readers for Jews, our age of legal culpability, our law begins at age 13 when boys and girls are bar and bat mitzvah. Then you are an adult and then you are Jewishly responsible for kissing, for hugging, for whatever, after or under. But under you can do, you're, you're not responsible. So for me, not knowing what the audience would look like, not knowing who my audience would be, I thought it was very important to legally make them poor Jews under the age of 13. And speaking of Jacob, and I absolutely love him because he's he's got a, a kind of a tough past. And and I think that was one reason he was so drawn to, to Rachel. Tell me how his development, how did you create him? So... So I dated a lot before I met my now husband. I was not Shomer Nagia. I, I touched touch boys and kissed boys. Um, but, you know, for me, every one of my heroes is my husband at its core. So one thing, you know, I talk in the book about the shit, which is for Jews, it's kind of not a soulmate. It's literally the the other half of your soul, you are cut. It is your destiny. Whatever you are put here to do, that person helps you fulfill your destiny. My husband and I are kind of like each other's yin and yang. But he also, what's sort of interesting is his father died when he was 10. Um, he kind of has a young sort of juvenile streak. I always have to yell at my husband not to play on grocery carts at the, you know, at when he's shopping like a kid. I'm like, why are you, stop, you're gonna hurt yourself. You're like almost 40, you're gonna fall down. Um, and so when I was writing, but also my husband and my caregiver, he has always loved me through my illness. He, those two years would wash my hair in the bathtub with a cup. He never once yelled at me. He never blamed at me, if any, blamed me. If anything, he really um, was the one who got me to sort of accept those bad days and let me be taken care of. Yeah. And so I wanted those aspects in Jacob. I wanted him to have that like immaturity streak, those abandonment issues that my husband struggled with in terms of losing his father young. But most of all, I wanted Jacob to meet her disease in a way that she wasn't, which was always, always believing her as sick. Yeah. 
so in Jacob, his role in this book, other than to be the love interest or the arch enemy, you know, from camp, he is the person who is in charge. He is, it's his company of the matzah ball. And I read in your acknowledgments, because I did a lot of Googling as well. There are these balls out there during Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they originally started as a way for young Jewish people in cities uh, that during Christmas Eve, when everyone's friends were off with their families, we poor Jews were like sitting alone being like, well, this is boring and everybody's having fun. So they were like, let's put these balls on or these parties and the young Jewish singles can have a place to go and maybe they'll meet and get married. That's very important in our culture, meeting other Jews and getting married. So um, they were originally just like that, just like singles meat markets. And um, over the years, they have expanded. Now there's like uh, ski matzo ball weeks and, and lock the paloozas and, you know, different names and different and sponsored by different groups. But it's the same general idea. It's an event that's held when your uh, Christian counterparts are off doing their own thing and there's nothing left to do. And, and you know, LGBT version, straight version, uh, over 50, there are all types of them. So if you're single and looking for love, go in your go to your community. <laughs> go see the near, nearest city and see what they have. But this matzo ball isn't just an ordinary one. We're talking, he was throwing like the biggest matzo ball oh, this one? ever. The hottest ticket in town. Yes. The hottest ticket in town. This is the biggest one. He, he's turning it in because he has all this experience doing music festival. Um, and I love some of the new Jewish pop music that's out there. You know, just Jews are just like everybody else. We see what the culture is doing and we do something similar. So if you guys have never heard of a group like the Maccabees, I go and listen to them. They're so fun. Um, and you can add it to your Christmas music uh, repertoire. They are amazing. I think we may have lost our connection. Did I just... Contact? There you are. There you are. You're back. Okay, good. We lost you for a second. So can you hear me? Yes, Jean? I see. So, yeah, I, I can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so I want to kind of switch gears. And I think we've lost her again, but I'm sure we're going to get her back. Um, just real quick while we're getting her connection back. Um, we have another, oh, this is from Lee. Lee says, how wonderful that your husband is so supportive and inspires your character. I could not agree more. You have to have a supportive family or a friend or support system to be a writer. Um, so now we're back. Um, Jean, you have written multiple books. So the matzo ball was book number one. Um, so tell me a little bit about your, we'll get to Kissing Kosher next, but I think the second book was Perfect on Paper. Mr. Perfect on paper, yes. So um, that also, this was also inspired by my life and my journey. Um, this Mr. Perfect on paper is an interfaith love story. Uh, my husband was not Jewish when I met him um, and we had a long trajectory. And basically it's about a woman who's a third generation math major. Again, she uh, lives with generalized anxiety disorder, which is a disease I live with. She is the, the uh, CEO of JMate, which is the world's biggest Jewish app, uh, uh, what do you call it, Jewish app program in the world. She's made over 10,000 successful matches, but unfortunately she has been unlucky in love herself because of her generalized anxiety disorder. So one day she's going on television to promote this new widget. Um, and basically her bubby decides to out her list for the perfect Jewish husband on national television. Now, this is a list that is never supposed to see the light of day. It was made drunkenly with her sister one night during the occasion of her 34th birthday. So what happens? It gets read, it goes viral, and um, this reporter, Christopher Steadfast, a sexy Southern uh, widower, wants to turn it into must-see television to follow her journey to finding love. Uh, but unfortunately, as the stories, as these stories go, we're in a rom-com. The more she keeps looking for Mr. Perfect on paper, she keeps realizing that her heart is drawn more and more to Christopher Steadfast, the totally charming, but also not Jewish reporter following her story. And again, that was inspired by my own love story. I was a first year rabbinical student. I went on a cruise with my co-in-laws and uh, I, what we call Makatunim, 
And uh, I met this guy and he was a soldier. He was about to deploy to Iraq. He was living in his mama's basement. He was still in college. He was all the things a nice Jewish girl in rabbinical school was not supposed to be with. And I fell head over heels in love. And he fell head over heels in love too. And that and and so I wanted to write a book that really explored what it means to love your faith, but then fall fall in love with someone outside of your faith. Oh, I love that. And we have so many Facebook, uh, the, our Facebook user said so wonderful. Uh, love these titles. They're awesome. I couldn't agree more because sometimes getting the title right is as hard as writing the entire book. Do you usually come up with the title first or you come up with the book and then you go to the title? So amazingly, the matzo ball and Mr. Perfect on paper was the title from the beginning and they went with it. Kissing Kosher was the book that had the most, um, like we we went back and forth. It originally started as half baked because uh, it takes place in a bakery and there's some uh, material in there about medicinal cannabis because it's a chronic pain book. Um, but eventually the title became Kissing Kosher, which I love. Well, let's talk about that book, the one that got starred, as I said earlier, by Kirkus Review. And for those out there- And, who and book list called it uh, one of the top 10 romances of 2023. Okay, incredible. And, and yeah. that, a star review at Kirkus is, it is a, I, I mean, it, <laughs> it is finding that pearl in an, an oyster. It does, it does not happen often. And so tell us, because that is actually on my list uh, for next month to read. Tell our audience a little bit about that book. Sure. So Kissing Kosher is about a man named Ethan Lipman. He's heir to this baked goods empire. Um, and he he is sent at the behest of his iron-fisted grandfather uh, to go undercover at this very small artisanal bakery in Brooklyn in order to steal their recipe for pumpkin spice babka. Um, but while committing corporate espionage, he meets a third generation owner, Abatov Cohen, who also happens to be a woman suffering from sexual dysfunction due to chronic pelvic pain, leaving both to wonder if they have the uh, right recipe for falling in love. Oh, I love and that. Again, yeah. And Secret, we have chronic pain. Um, well, we have a Facebook, someone who just said, I have read all three of Jean's books and I have loved all of them. And we have another one. I've read all three books and have loved them. And I can see why, because again, I've, I've read the matzo ball and it was one of my favorite books and cannot say enough about it. But um, so let's talk a little bit about you as a writer. So you were a screenwriter, uh, correct? And then you won a daytime Emmy. Congratulations. That's huge. How did being a screenwriter translate into writing an actual novel? So I think actually it took a really long time to translate my skills from screenwriting into learning how to write a novel, I feel like. But I will say one of the things that I, I feel like I do well or that comes from my screenwriting background is I'm a very visual uh, writer. So I try to, you know, it is rare, and, and I have to kind of learn to do this in romance. You know, in screenwriting, the sin of screenwriting is you never have two people sitting around a table talking because there's no action, there's no movement. Um, that's kind of the joke. You know, the, there's a joke that like, you never have two people sitting at a table talking unless there's a gun under the table <laughs> because there's no tension in that, that you're just explaining things. But in a romance, you can totally have two people sitting at a table talking. People love seeing people sit at tables talking. So it's it's sort of, uh, for me, I think you see sort of the shtick and the antics and the, you can almost, I think it's why my books translate very well to the audiobook. It's because there's so much happening, like actually happening. Um, and then I had to learn how to sort of write in in ways where they would actually have conversations instead of just movement. <laughs> but it took a while to translate the skills. Well, how long did it take you to write the matzo ball from the beginning to the end when you started it to writing those wonderful words, the end? So the matzo ball itself only took me a few months, but I have been sort of writing for myself uh, for years before that. And I have had one book earlier, about a decade before, that I was agented, I had an R&R, &R, but I never sold it. So 
at that point I was, I was also ill and I was just like, you know what, it's not good for me, the publishing, it's too much up and down. I need to just focus on my health. So I wasn't really writing to publish. And even when I wrote the matzo ball, I think that's why when you read that book, it's just such a free book. It, it was never, I never in a million years thought it would see the light of day. Um, happily it did, but I really thought it was a book that was just going to be for me, maybe my niece. Um, I, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do with it. So, uh, but you know what they say in publishing, it's usually timing meets skill. So I think all those years of sort of just figuring out my instincts, finally, that that was the most important lesson I needed to learn. I needed to learn how to trust my own instincts in writing. Well, here at Book a Shard Trip, as you know, we have a lot of enthusiastic readers and they have loved you this week. Everyone is commenting and people just love the double giveaway. Um, but we have a lot of people who are also authors or people who are thinking about it. They, they have that little idea in the back of their head. Is there one piece of advice that you could give our audience on what, what helped you be successful or what really helped you become the writer that you are today? So I'll, I'll give two little bits of advice. My first is do not tie your value into a book. I cannot, I cannot say this enough. Publishing is very fickle. There's lots of reasons why a book gets chosen to be published or not. You can absolutely write a great book and it cannot get picked up. I think what I said before still holds. You have to know who you are and what you want to say when you sit down to write a book. And if you know that, if you've done the best you can with every page, with every word, if, you, if you've done all that, then there's nothing left to do. You've done it. You've done the work. Do it for yourself. Do it for because it gives you joy. And try to, it sounds wild, but try to put everything else, everything else outside your mind, right? Because you need, you are burning to do it. I love that. Thank you so much. Because that's, it, it's hard to hear, you know, my criticism because with any book, I don't care what it is, you are going to get criticism. And I think that sometimes stops people, but the thing I love what you talked about, and you talked about it earlier on our Facebook feed, I think it might've been Monday. You asked what gives you joy. And mm -hmm. that's the other thing I found. So, so it was all throughout the matzo ball. And tell me a little bit about why that means so much to you, because you really do express, you express joy. So for me, it's very, very simple. I talked a little bit about that dark period in my life where I was completely bed bound. I wasn't leaving the house. My husband's washing my hair. I am spending all day in bed. And, you know, I always say chronic illness, it brings you to your very low, lowest places. It tells you that you're invalid. It tells you your life has evolved past the point of worth. And it was in that dark moment, I had a choice. I could either give up, I could give into this feeling, or I could survive. And so I made this decision, this very conscious decision that even if my entire life was just gonna be four square walls of a bedroom in Virginia, even if I was going to be nothing more than my husband's disabled wife for the rest of my life, I was gonna find a way to be happy. So that's kind of what I did. I started you know, trying to figure out ways to find joy. I turned off social media. I, I turned off the news. I began, um, I got some plants. I tried to meditate. I, began reading romance. I did not pick up a romance book till I was 38. Changed my life, right? But it was part of this, mm -hmm. I only want good things in my brain. I only want to feel good because so much of what happens during chronic illness is this feeling of like a loss of hope and, and you start getting in your own head. And so your value is still there. You just need to be reminded of it. Yeah, you need to remind yourself of it. I am worthwhile, I am good. And also from home, as part of this joy, I was able to do all sorts of things for other people too. I began to get involved in advocacy and act activism. So I began writing senators in Congress with any action in order to get increased funding for my disease. I collected backpacks for my bedroom uh, for a local homeless teen shelter in my area. I sponsored the creation of a um, uh, online um, synagogue, a sea door for them to have that everyone could use. This was way before the pandemic. And, you know, this is a true story. I always tell this story um, because 
I was watching a TLC show on extreme couponing. I became an extreme couponer, couponer myself. I started turning those once every two month grocery runs into like stockpile trips of like toiletries and food. And I would donate them to the local food pantries. And, you know, through this process, not only did it become my mantra, but it brought me to writing again. It brought me to writing these books that were so focused on joy. And what happened is when Matzo Ball was published, all these people came up to me and they were like, I needed this book. Mm -hmm. So it was crazy because I wrote that book originally for me and for my niece, but so many other people needed to be reminded of the value of their joy. And so it has become, you know, the realization that we as a society, we are driven by toxicity and anger. And I don't want to be one of those people. I want to be the, the voice that comes out and says, it's okay to be happy. We need to be happy. We can't control everything, but we can tr control how we relate with the rest of the world. And when we're joyful and when we're happy, we bring our best selves into a room. Thank you so much for sharing that because I think that a lot of people, although the, the holiday season, it's, it's a joyous time, but sometimes we get lost in, I have to cook. I have to clean. I got to do this. I got to do that. That we voice. Play. Yeah. Never say I have to. I get to. I get to. <laughs> I get to. That is a wonderful message. And that is a wonderful way to, to kind of wrap up this interview. And you have been a delight. We still get you for another day and a half. I'm going to. No. So sad when I take off our little banner that it's no longer author take the wheel, but I hope you stick with us and and we would I love you. Will. But you. You have been wonderful. And I know our audience, they are going to want to stay in touch with you. Could, could you give them a link to your website or, or social media links? Here, should I do it here? Um, okay, so very easy. G Meltzer on Instagram, uh, G Meltzer author on Facebook, and gmeltzer.com for my website. I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> A lot of people are going to are going to watch this in replay. And if you guys comment, um, Jean will still answer questions. I'll answer questions. Um, but it has been wonderful. Uh, Lee says, great discussion, ladies. Another thank you. Lee says, I get it. The not I have to. I love that. So that's I'm going to take that with me for the rest of not just today, but the rest of the year into next year. And Thank you so much. And you have been wonderful. And until next time, everyone. I love you guys. Bye. Amen.